What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Geek Pantheon. I am Eric, and today I have a special review for all of you from Together Studios, written by Keith Baker, Chronicles of Eberron. There's a whole team behind this book, and I will say up front, they did a phenomenal job in creating this book. I would highly recommend it to any fan of Eberron or anybody that just enjoys compelling lore and wants a treasure trove of things to steal from, because there is so much to, to steal from in this book for your Eberron game or your Dragonlance game or your homebrew uh, campaign setting. Uh, my home game right now is a homebrew campaign and I can guarantee you there's a ton of stuff in here that I will be stealing. So out the gate, I will say this book is divided up into two sections, the library and the vault. Section one, the library is for everyone to read. And uh, section two, the vault is for DMs to read because it's got a lot more of the secrets of the world contained in there. Still no word on the morning and what caused that gang. Sorry. Um, we're never going to get it, but you know, we can always dream. No, I'm just kidding. Of course. Anyway, uh, I want to give kind of a high level review, not go chapter by chapter or anything because just pulling the curtain back, I tried to do that and the video was very long. So <laughs> um, I want to give you all a sense of what's in this book and whether or not it's something that you should be interested in picking up. So in the first section, uh, the library, uh, one thing that I really appreciate is uh, the tone of the, the, not even the tone, the voice of this book. So with fifth edition, it's very clear that they have tried to keep the the voice of their books in universe. Like every spell is written as if a wizard in the world wrote that spell. And uh, then you have to kind of figure out the mechanics. It's worse with some spells like the sleep spell, I think is one of the most infamous ones of like, this could have been written with like a third of the words. Um, but even when they're talking about things in the world, it still very much has that voice of in-universe speech. This book has that some of the time, but it's not afraid to get anachronistic. It's not afraid to get mechanical. And I appreciate that. There's an example where it's talking about like spies in the world and talking about how uh, House Fearlin uh, and House Thrani are known as entertainers. And so telling somebody that Fearlin runs a spy network would be the equivalent of somebody saying that Elvis was in the CIA. Not impossible, but your average person would be like, oh yeah, sure, okay. Um, so I appreciate that tone of using our real world examples as an easier way of us understanding the fantasy world. So I will applaud the voice of this book on that. And there are moments where Keith gets into the creation of Eberron and kind of the design intent back when they were designing it in third edition and how things have had to be changed for fifth edition and how that is reflected in the world. And it's almost like a DVD director's commentary on the world of Eberron where you're getting behind the scenes insight. Does that reference date me? Like... People, <sighs> director commentaries were huge when I was in college. People loved them, but there's not DVDs anymore. So do people, anyway. Um, but yeah, the library section is a phenomenal breakdown of the world. and has some great uh, mechanical player options. Uh, some new subclasses for the paladin, bard, cleric, and rogue. Uh, some new spells in there, some new cool meta magic options for sorcerers. Uh, so really cool stuff. There is a very helpful mini table of contents at the front of the book if you're just looking for the mechanical things, which from a quality of life standpoint is a brilliant touch for the book. I will say the book hits its stride once it hits chapter five, because I think the reason that a lot of us, especially the Eberron nerds like myself, look forward to these books, why we really loved exploring Eberron and we were looking forward to Chronicles of Eberron is the depth that we can get into with these books that you can't get into in a first party Wizard of the Coast book because they have to cover a lot of real estate in as few page count as possible. And these books, at least it feels like we're afforded the chance to get a little bit deeper. And we don't really get that until chapter five when we get to the Tarnadol Elves chapter. And then for the rest of the library section, the Tarnadol Elves, the two gnome chapters, and the Dark Six chapter are all great in terms of the depth of knowledge that you get. Uh, the first four chapters are really good. The common knowledge, chapter one, where it kind of gets into, what does the average person know about this world? What would the average player character know about this world? So helpful. As somebody that has spent so many years 
diving deep on Eberron lore, it can be difficult at times for me both as a player and as a DM to know, okay, what would I actually <laughs> know as a player uh, character as opposed to what Eric the player knows? Because the Eric the player knows a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate that they kind of broke that down into what is common knowledge in this. Oh, and you get a whole section on crossbows. Uh, in the world and like different crossbow manufacturers and makes and models of crossbows and how to modify them. Didn't know I needed that, but I'm sure I'm glad I have it because it's, it, it was honestly one of the highlights of the first section of the book, the library section, just because it was so unexpected. And I was like, this is great. And then getting into the vault, the first two chapters cover session zero and it's all about the journey, kind of filling the spaces in between adventures. Really solid. I, I feel like I have a sense of how Keith Baker runs a session zero now. And there are some really cool tidbits that I'm definitely going to pull uh, for my next session zero uh, whenever that comes about. And it's all about the journey is it has some really cool tools to kind of fill in the gaps as you're going about. And the montage thing where you just ask your players like, okay, you ask the rogue on the first day, a group of bandits tried to ambush you all. How did you help the party avoid that? And letting them narrate how they did a cool thing. No roles, just let them tell you how they did a cool thing. And then chapter 11 and 12 cover pretty large sections of the world. We get the Baron Sea, uh, which is called that because it's basically like the Dead Sea in our world of like hyper salinity, not life in the sea, but it's an ocean. <laughs> um, and you get some really cool lore about the deep, deep ocean where the Kua Toa currently live, but they used to be the Kuo Toa and that like plot hooks galore. Um, and also I, I skipped over the dark six chapter. Also ton of plot hooks highlight of the book for me. One of the things I was looking forward to the most was like a breakdown on the dark six. Um, so I will say that was also a big highlight for me. Uh, definitely check out that chapter, the astral plane. I don't know what I was expecting when I started the astral plane chapter, but it wasn't that. And I'm glad I got more than what I bargained for. Um, it, I, I have to I have to find a way to run an Eberron game that deals with the astral plane now based on what's in this chapter. I'm not going to get into hyper spoilers because I had so much joy reading this chapter and be like, holy crap, like this is amazing. That's amazing. That's super cool. Definitely want to use that. Um, just know that uh, read the astral plane chapter, then read it again. <laughs> because you're going to have missed a really cool sentence that will send you on a whole new rabbit hole of cool ideas. Um, but I would say just breaking down chapter to chapter in terms of what I felt while reading it. Uh, in the library, The Dark Six was number one. And in the vault, Astro Plane was number one. Uh, because, yeah, I was just, it was very evocative and a really well written chapter. Then we get a whole section, like three chapters worth dealing with, I'm going to call the overlords in general, where you get like the overlords, uh, Ashkatala, the city of demons, and then the first war, which is this idea that the war between the overlords and the dragons never ended. It's still going on. And when you're dealing with a war that covers tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, um, how it affects your campaign can be really terrifying because these entities are moving so slow. And the example that it gives is this idea that like the beggar king has to kill Queen Arala with the Blade of Sorrows and then the wild heart will be awakened. And it's like, okay, who's the beggar king? We need to figure that out. And it's like, okay, it's uh, Prince Orgev. Okay, so we need to make sure that the mourning happens so that he becomes a beggar king. Okay, great. Well, he needs to use the Blade of Sorrows, which was crafted by the Dakani. Uh, goblins. So 10,000 years prior to the morning, we need to make sure that that specific Dashur crafts that specific blade and that it's left in a position where Orgev can get a hold of it and then put him in a position where he can kill Queen Arala. But we also have to make sure that Queen Arala doesn't die at any point prior to that. And we have to make sure that Orgev doesn't. And so you just really get a sense of the scope of manipulating the Draconic Prophecy and how that works in the context of this first war. And that was a really fun thought experiment to kind of look at that and think through all those different, or see, see the thought process that goes into all those different elements. And then we get another kind of three chapter section on uh, Undead. We get Ghost Stories of Eberron, uh, the Grim Lords, and the Carnathi Undead are the names of the chapters. 
um, which the Grim Lords are probably the most compelling just as an organization of these entities that uh, that rule over Falnin and are these like hyper powerful undead creatures that manipulate the world and um, I don't, I don't know. It was very evocative and compelling to read. And I want more stories with those characters. I want to play more stories with those characters. So yeah, I'm going to have to find a table that I can play at instead of being a DM. I mean, Kyber Shards, I could talk to Philip about going there. We'll see. Uh, one thing I did appreciate in the Carnathi Undead chapter is the, the primary focus is canon with a C, canon with a K distinctions on how undead operate within Eberron with like undead being this very um, immutable, unchangeable thing in C canon where a skeleton is a skeleton, a zombie is a zombie, etc. Whereas with canon with a K, there's a bit more well, a lot more malleability and you know this idea that necromancy would also be an industry alongside evocation magic and transmutation magic where necromancers would seek to find ways to improve their craft and so yeah right now zombies are unthinking unfeeling uh <laughs> zombies um but would they be content to stop there or would they rather seek to iterate and improve upon the magic to try and give zombies a bit more intelligence um, make them a bit bigger, a bit faster. Uh, same with skeletons. Uh, would would you not try to maintain a bit of the skeleton skill set in life or uh, their personality or their ability to self-regulate and stuff like that? And so I, I think that's a lot cooler and I appreciate the, kind of the breakdown of necromancy as an industry and, and how they would seek to iterate that. And then we get two chapters, each covering a different, I'm going to say big bad for the the setting. Uh, it's certainly an entity of evil. Uh, Mordain the Flesh Weaver, uh, who is definitely an iconic figure in Eberron lore, a uh, wizard that took things far too far. And also uh, Vosh the Twister of Roots, which is a Dalkir that is, uh, manipulates plants and nature. One thing I appreciate is that uh, in early in the chapter with Avash, they were talking about uh, wooden soldiers that she can create and how they have like fibrous wooden muscle structure. And my brain went, that sounds a lot like the Warforged muscle structure. That'd be a cool idea to like play with. Whoa, are the Warforged like a uh, creation of Avash? Later on in the chapter, they they call that out too. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a really cool idea. Good job, Eric. And then like five pages later, I was like, oh, okay, well. I still had the idea first, uh, I guess. But yeah, that's a really compelling storyline of like, there's, there's been a lot of writing about like the origin of the Warforge on the continent of Zendrick and what role the quarry might be playing in the creation of Warforge. But physically, they resemble what Avash can do. And so is there a connection there? Maybe. One thing that I will say when looking at the monster card for somebody like Avash, that's a CR 22 creature that I was, I don't want to say let down or disappointed, just I, I kind of gotten excited about the prospect of it and then it wasn't there, but it's something you can easily homebrew is I, I wish for creatures like the Delk here, we had mythic, uh, it making, making them a mythic monster from the, the, I almost said Theranos book, <laughs> Um, from the Theros book, uh, that where you know you you kill them. It's it's a multi stage monster battle, um, but the mythic actions are like ramp up in intensity. Uh, just because the Delk here, typically a CR twenty two creature, is going to be your final boss or close to your final boss. Um, so I would have liked to have seen that utilized. I get keeping it simple for people that maybe don't uh, have that book or didn't enjoy that book. Uh, but that was just one thing that I was like, oh, this would be really cool to see. Um, but that's just my own deal. And then the final chapter with like lore information is the Riedra chapter, which is whoo, so much information on Riedra. You could run, you can run an entire campaign uh, in Riedra and in Sarlona in general. Like you get so much information on this section of the world and kind of how to use fifth edition rules with it because obviously we don't have a robust psionic system like we did in previous editions. But the depth that you get on just the Riedra as a nation and the different provinces of Riedra and who they were before the rise of the Dreaming Dark and how they came to fall under the influence of the Inspired and what they're doing now and is there resistance there? And you like, yeah, you get so much and they're like, you could, 
you could do an entire campaign there or probably more more aligned to what I would do. You could put like the entire act two of a campaign in Riedra and have so much to do to work your way up through those levels before going to the next stage of the campaign. Um, but yeah, like I was really impressed by the depth that you get with Riedra because I wasn't expecting it. I saw that we were getting a chapter in Riedra. It's like, okay, we'll get like a nice deep dive on the nation. I was not expecting a deep dive on each province of the region and the history of those provinces and the specialties of those provinces. And it truly felt like it for the first time for me anyway, not saying this is true for everyone else. First time for me, Riedra feels like a proper element of the world, with the same le depth and care that's been given to Corvair and Zendrick. So I really like this chapter and appreciate the the attention to detail and the care that was given to this part of the world. And the final chapter is on high level adventures and basically different uh, enemy types and how to ramp up the difficulty and uh, make a campaign that goes all the way to level 20. Uh, it's just an advice chapter akin to the session zero uh, chapter kind of sandwiching the vault section on, on how to play Eberron in those higher levels. Uh, and that's the whole book. So real quick, Huge thumbs up to the book. Um, I really enjoyed it all the way through. Uh, there weren't any sections that I like slogged through and wasn't enjoying reading, but then again, I'm a fan of Eberron. So all this new information um, is, is always fun to engage with. One thing that I really appreciate, A, the voice that I talked about before, but also there are sections of the book uh, in the, the high level uh, adventures chapter, reminding me of this because it's in there. Practical examples are given on breaking stuff like this down. So in this chapter, an entire campaign by tiers is broken down of like prologue levels one through four, then five through 10 and uh, 11 through 15. Um, and it it gives you that example. And so you have all of the theory written out, but then the practical application of it is also given to you so that you can further understand it. Um, and that's also done earlier and basically uh, Keith Baker breaks down Tira Myron's story into a D and D campaign and like, okay, how, how would we do this? Um, and so that's something that is done in this book that I think is phenomenal and more source books should absolutely do stuff like that. Um, have you checked out the book yet? What are you thinking so far? Let me know down below. Are you enjoying the purchase? Um, and what's your, what's your favorite chapter of the book? Uh, for me, like I said, in the library, it was Dark Six. In the vault, it was the Astral uh, Plane. Probably Astral Plane would be number one, though. Astral Plane is probably my favorite chapter, just because there were so many cool revelations and things that I want to play with now. So let me know down below. Thank you all so much for watching. I've been Eric, and I will see you next time.